start off with the anatomy, and the anatomy, well, in terms of development, um, there's a few things we can learn by comparing the spinal cord in development. 12 weeks gestation means 12 weeks pregnant. And then compared to the adult, we're primarily concerned with the adult. The spinal cord pictured here is inside the protected bony case, the vertebral column, which we just studied. And what we learn about the spinal cord is that um, in, at 12 weeks pregnancy, the spinal cord length is the same length as the vertebral column. Called the spinal cord development. At 12 weeks. Gestation, spinal cord length. Is as long as the vertebral canal. <coughs> As you can see, in a full-grown adult, the spinal um, the spinal cord is shorter. The spinal um, cord typically ends at around the level between L1 and L2. It's it's right around here. So what we see is that in development from 12 weeks pregnancy to a full-grown adult, uh, the vertebral column lengthens quite a bit, more so than the spinal cord needs to. <coughs> in an adult, uh, the spinal cord ends at around L1 slash L2 vertebra. So inferior to that, in the vertebral canal, you would have spinal nerves just kind of hang below. Spinal nerves hang inferiorly <coughs> below this level. The other thing we see from this slide, it may be hard to see sitting in the back, but they, they color code the spinal cord. It turns out the spinal cord, it's a segmented cord, and it's arranged in the same regions as the vertebral column. Spinal cord is segmented. Total, all the segments add up to about 18 inches in length, but it's arranged into cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, coccygeal regions. So the segments of the spinal cord have the same name as the bony vertebral column. Okay. So what you can have to do is like, are we talking about spinal nerves or vertebra, right? Because they have the same designation. Let's move on from this slide. So to view the, the spinal cord inside the vertebral column on a cadaver, usually what's performed is something called a some sort of laminectomy. The lamina 
Well, I think that was on one of your quizzes. Part of the neural arch, you got the lamina and the pedicle here. Usually when I perform this, um, you kind of like use a hammer and chisel, and you kind of like, just kind of Maybe you use some like uh, grips to gnaw away at those plate-like lamina on one side and the other side. And then using that as a kind of lever, you just kind of pull it off gently. And then that would give you a full view inside here, so you can view this spinal cord. And if you do that up and down, the well, entire length of the spinal cord, as they've done in this picture here, you can kind of get a view of the spinal cord. So I, I realize it's, it's, it's hard to see. Um, if you use the app, there's some things that are shown a little better. Let me switch to the app. Hold on a second. <coughs> I'm going to turn on the uh, nerves. I'm going to hide the skeleton. So we just have the nervous system showing. And you're looking at the spinal cord encased in the dura. the dura. Oops. I'm going to hide the arachnoid matter. And get, basically, that's the view of the spinal cord. So, in terms of the anatomy, there's not much to see. It's a cord. So if I really zoom in, can you see how um, this is the anterior aspect? Do you see how like in the cord there's a groove right down the middle? Well, you can see that there are spinal nerves coming off each segment of the spinal cord. Can you see this groove right down the middle? There's a groove in the front, and there's a groove in the back. I can rotate it for you. So that's the back, just to it myself, right? And then, I know the eyeballs are in the front. It's not the groove in the front. Now, the groove in the front is called the anterior median fissure. Spinal cord structures. <laughs> and that groove I showed you in the back is the posterior median sulcus. I pull back just a little bit. I don't know if you can see this, but the as you look at the whole cord, if you zoom in on the top part, the cervical region, there's a part that's a little bit expanded, just a little bit. It's very slight. It's an enlargement of the spinal cord at a specific region right around here. If I ever label this part of the spinal cord in the cervical region and I say identify, be specific, I'm trying to get you to identify the cervical enlargement. That's what it's called, cervical enlargement. <coughs> the part of the spinal cord is a little wider because the cell bodies are a little bigger in this region. These are, uh, well, this is basically the spinal cord that controls the upper extremity. Spinal nerves in this region control, I'll just put UE. UE stands for upper extremity.
So the enlargement that controls the lower extremity, if I kind of pull back and go down, um, they, they allow me to highlight it. So the part that's highlighted in green, it's a little bit enlarged. It's called the, the lumbosacral enlargement. Uh, basically, well, the spinal nerves that come off this region control um, lower extremity. So basically the same thing, same statement as before. Spinal nerves. This region control lower extremity. So yeah, upper extremity, lower extremity. And we'll talk about the muscles later. Um, also, let me zoom in here. It's kind of hard to visualize with all the nerves coming off it. I highlighted something in green, but all the nerves kind of obscure the view. The, the cone tip of a spinal cord has a name. It's called the conus medullaris, referring to the end of the spinal cord. Let me write on the wall here. So imagine you have the end of the spinal cord, it's a little bit enlarged, but it has a cone tip. Okay, uh, the cone tip is called the conus medullaris. Now, the conus medullaris just describes the shape of the end of the spinal cord. L1 slash L2. However, um, spinal nerves that come off <coughs> I said that the spinal nerves and end his nerves, they hang <coughs> inferiorly in the end. And uh, it resembles, they, they resemble a horse tail. So the structure is called cauda equina. Which means horse tail. They're spinal nerves, they just look like a horse tail. It's not hair. <laughs> okay, I don't want you to think that. They're nerves. Also, let's remember that um, the membranes that cover the spinal cord, the meninges, there's one called the pia mater that's most intimate with the spinal cord. Mm. We're drawing red here, pia mater. gets to the conus medullaris, it actually extends within the cauda equina as a little thread. So that, that little thread called the phelum terminale. It's an extension of pia mater. It's not a nerve, it's connective tissue. So 
I ever am able to indicate a thread right in the middle of the cauda equina, it's the felum terminality. I think the apple has been highlighted. Let me uh, take a look here. That one. That's the felum terminality, <coughs> the little thread I have highlighted within the cauda equina. Uh, you can barely see it. It projects, but it's that thread that extends all the way right down the middle, all the way right there. That's the felum terminality. What, what it's going to do? It's going to anchor to the posterior aspect of coccyx to kind of like hold the spinal cord in place, so it's not slack in the vertebral canal. Attaches to cockpit. All right. back to the PowerPoint slides. And so you can use the pictures. They're, they're a bit better to study in your book in front of you so, instead of a presentation. But um, the, what the picture is showing you is everything that we talked about. So our core enlargement. Um, you can see here that they've cut open the dura. Right, so you can see at each segmented level, you can see a pair of spinal nerves um, exits the vertebral um, exits the vertebral canal, exits the vertebral column, I should say. So that's the top view, the superior aspect of the spinal cord. Here's the inferior view. And um, they indicate the lumbosacral enlargement. They kind of point to where the conus medullaris would be, although you really can't see it. They indicate the cauda equina, but they do not indicate the felum terminality, which you are responsible for. All right, so this is a picture from the Marriott textbook. Those previous pictures were from the Gilroy Atlas. But I chose this one. It shows three spinal cord segments. How do I know? I see three pairs of spinal nerves coming off. Okay. Spinal nerves being right there. Okay. And at each segment, they show the meninges being peeled away. There's the dura mater, there's the arachnoid mater, and there's the pia mater. Now, I've already noted those for you uh, in previous lectures, so you can go back and look at that. But they do cover the spinal cord as well. However, those meninges, what they are, um, the spinal meninges and cerebral spinal fluid, collectively the dura mater, the rhacoid mater, and the pia mater, they surround the brain and spinal cord, and they form the spinal meninges. These membranes and cerebral spinal fluid surround, support, protect you know, everything, including the cauda equina. And this picture from the, go back to that picture from the atlas, what I did was I kind of pointed to like all the, the meninges uh, and all the spaces that you're responsible to know when you study these in a cross-sectional view. So what you're looking at is a um, sectional view through a cervical region. Okay. I think it's C4. But anyways, um, see the bony encasement you can see inside the vertebral foramen, you have all of these spaces and structures. I mean, that's the main thing, right? That's the uh, <coughs> spinal cord. Well, anyways, <coughs> on a figure of likeness, be able to identify all of these things I have numbered. Starting with, I guess, number one. It's the space around the dura. So it's the epidural space, right? Epi means surrounding, overlying.
As you can see from the picture, this space is usually filled with fat and veins. <coughs> space surrounding dura mater filled with adipose and blood vessels or veins. Um, so if you ever heard the term epidural, <laughs> epidural, they're referring to the space where you just stick your catheter and anesthetize. You can look it up, you're not responsible for that. But you, perhaps you've heard that term before. Um, that's the space. Now, <clears throat> the actual membrane is the dura mater, number two. That's what dura mater is, and it's the thickest of the membranes. And um, right beneath that, um, you have the arachnoid mater. <coughs> and right below that, you have the subarachnoid space. This is the space where uh, CSF circulates. I mentioned that previously. That's kind of an important space to know for that reason. CSF is kind of bathing the central nervous system. Um, all right, and then number five indicates the pia mater. And number six indicates a ligament I want you to know inside the vertebral foramen. It's the denticulate ligaments which provide lateral support for the spinal cord inside. basic stuff. If I show you another picture, but you see, well, let me ask you this. Do you see a spinal cord inside there? Yes or no? I say yes, no question. Yeah. Do you see a spinal cord? Mm -hmm. Now, are you sure about that? <laughs> There's no spinal cord. <laughs> see all that? Those are a bunch of cut spinal nerves. We call them the cauda equina. Remember, if you're kind of below the level with L1, L2, these are at L2. No spinal cord. Inferior to the spinal cord below that level is cauda equina. There's no spinal cord here. Okay. That's why I always put that slide in. You always expect, oh, there's got to be a spinal cord in there. There's not once you get below L1. And here's the same figure from the book. They kind of show the, the meningeal layers there uh, where you do have spinal cord. So let's talk about the spinal nerves. <coughs> A little more. So again, what do you see there? No spinal cord, spinal nerves of the cauda equina. <coughs> but the spinal nerves themselves, they have names, just like the vertebra. And this figure from the atlas is kind of showing you that. And the spinal cord is divided into four regions, like we had said cervical, lumbar, thoracic, sacral, you know. And you have 31 pairs of spinal nerves that exit the vertebral column. This over here is showing you if you damage at a certain level, you get cut off from the brain. So the higher up you go, the more function that you lose. Okay, the further down you go, the more function you preserve because more of the core can, can communicate with the major part of the CNS, the brain. Attack, it usually, well, for sure, indicates that part of the heart muscle died. Okay. You probably have a problem with circulation. It must mean part of the brain also had ischemia and they lost some brain function too. Okay. You shouldn't lose any mo mobility from a heart attack if you survived it. Okay. 
Yeah, but a heart attack is a lack of blood flow problem. So if that's the case, they probably had the same thing happen in the brain. Loss of brain function would okay, lose coordination. Brain. Yeah. That's why their coordination is Yeah, okay. that would have to be that. Okay, so then let's review the cervical vertebra. How many are there? So there's seven. How many thoracic? Twelve. You're in lumbar? Five. Very good. And I was, a student once told me, oh, I, I remember the seven, twelve, five, like the times a day you eat. You eat breakfast at seven, lunch at noon, and dinner at five. Um, and then we did sacrum coccyx, S1 to S5. There's five. Um, Coxygeal, CO1, CO4. Usually there's four. Hey, can't wait, wait, that's the vertebra. Now, the spinal nerves that emanate from each segment of the spinal cord remember, there, there, there are pairs of them. Turns out you have eight cervical spinal nerves. You want to say, yeah, that's kind of a confusing thing. There's a C8 spinal nerve, but there's no C8 vertebra. Okay. But pretty much, it, it kind of holds true the rest of the way. There's going to be spinal nerves, T1 to T12. Uh, spinal nerves, L1 to L5. S1 to S5. There's one coxygeal spinal nerve. So you add it up, 8, 12, 5, 5, 1. That better add up to 31 or I made a mistake somewhere. Yeah, that's 31. 31 pairs of spinal nerves. They're pairs. Okay. So how many are there if they're pairs? 62. Okay. Well, how, how they're named, we kind of named them well, let's start at the top here. Um, you have to consider the spinal cord segment we're talking about. Okay. So if it's the cervical region, call it C something, the spinal nerve itself and the vertebra, where it exits. Does it exit above, above or below the vertebra? So it turns out um, C1 spinal nerve exits above C1 vertebra. And the same thing for C2. C2 spinal nerve exits above C2 vertebra. And it continues like this all the way to C7. Okay. Uh, C7 exits above. So what I'm writing is C7 exits above C7 vertebra. But that's um, when the switch occurs. C8 spinal nerve exits below C7 vertebra. C8 uh, spinal nerve exits below C7 vertebra. So I tried to zoom in on that region to show you. There's C7 vertebra. Okay. So that would be C7 spinal nerve, you know, exiting above it. But then here's C8 exiting below it. And then it kind of goes like that from there on down. All the spinal nerves exit below the corresponding vertebra. So for example, T1 spinal nerve exits below what? T1 vertebra. I'll just write that down. Let's see, excuse me, T1 
one spinal nerve. Exits below T1 vertebra all the way down, you know. It just continues like that. They all exit below. So that's how they're named. The spinal nerves. And there's pairs of them, as we'll know. But when you get all the way down to the sacrum, um, you can see that the spinal nerves in the sacral region, they're going to exit via the those sacral foramina that we talked about. That's what's shown there. Okay. All the other ones are exiting down the side on the intervertebral foramen. Right? That's what it said. I want to study just a segment. Okay. And this picture has three segments. And what it shows you is when you issue spinal nerves per segment, they may enter, um, they may innervate one muscle, or muscles may receive multiple inputs. Okay, for example, let's see. Oh, this one. This green one, colored green, is only receiving innervation from nerve roots from one segment. However, these two are receiving inputs from multiple segments. So it kind of does vary if you receive multi segment or mono segmental muscle innervation. Let me write that out. Muscles may receive innervation from one or more spinal cord segments. If it's one, that muscle is referred to as, that innervation is referred to as monosegmental muscle innervation. If it's more than one, call it more, uh, multi. Multi-segmental innervation. Okay, moving on. This segment, um, this picture gets it down to just one segment, and all the nerves that come off just one segment. And we have a lot of models like this picture over there. Okay. To all the anatomy structures that I've been mentioning, um, like for example on this picture, you want to start thinking about. The second page of the lab study guide. Let's put all the segments on there. And well, let's kind of like draw everything I think you should know now that's shown on this picture, all the structure. Studying a spinal cord segment. With all the nerves that come off of it. I've been calling them spinal nerves, but they're actually roots too, and then there's all these divisions and things like that. Studying one, spinal cord segment. So if you cut one of those segments out, a little cord, typically get this picture. I'll kind of simplify that a little bit. Always draw like this. kind of butterfly thing. So to start to label things, uh, right in the middle you have a perfect little hole drilled right down the middle where CSF flows up and down. It's the central canal. This little thing right here called that.
Now look at the picture. Do you see how the inside butterfly shape is more or less gray? So you have the gray matter on the inside and all around it is white matter. So you do have gray matter and white matter. Um, you know, the gray matter is arranged into horns. Like here, here, and here. We call it, you know, dorsal, lateral, ventral horns of the gray matter. <coughs> dorsal. Wait, you know, that's also posterior. Dorsal is your backside. So sometimes they say dorsal horn, or sometimes I say posterior horn, and I use both terms interchangeably. So dorsal or posterior horn. Number three, lateral horn. Number four, ventral or anterior horn. You know, also, um, you can see that it's a bilateral structure. If you cut it right down the middle, one side mirrors the other side. And a lot of times, information, as it travels up and down the spinal cord, sometimes it crosses over to the other side. So even though you have gray matter, um, <coughs> information kind of comes back in and out from dorsal to ventral. But information also goes up and down the spinal cord, and it uses the white matter to go up and down. But sometimes as it goes up, it kind of switches from left to right or from right to left. So it would, the information can kind of switch to that side or to that side. So basically, think of the two sides as being connected. They can communicate with each other. And in neurophysiology, they call that a commissure. So the space between the central canal that space there, uh, call it number five, where information can cross on that side. Um, it's called the, the gray commissure, okay? Um, I guess you can call this posterior gray commissure, and you can call this one the anterior gray commissure. Let's just call it five and six, the gray commissures for now. Five, six. gray commissures. We'll talk about more uh, why those are important later. Okay, well, you also have nerves coming off. Um, for example, okay, let me go on this. nerve roots coming off and they merge and then this splits immediately like that again they, they show all this on there I'll point it out to you okay well, anyways the, the nerve roots to study here are This nerve root right there, let's call this, what am I, number seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
<coughs> we'll go seven. Okay, this little bulb I drew will go eight, we'll go nine, we'll go 10, we'll go 11, we'll go 12. Number seven is called the, the dorsal root, or um, so what do they call it? Posterior root. or posterior root, in terms of its function, it's sensory in its function. Uh, let's remember that sensory means information is going into the CNS. So let me draw uh, the unipolar cell. Remember, the, that's the kind of, that's the, the structure of the neuron. whose cell body is in this little ganglion here called number eight, which is the dorsal root ganglion. Which is also called the posterior root ganglion. Remember, dorsal and posterior are interchangeable. Well, anyways, it's sensory in function because the cell body's in there. So that's just the cell body in the ganglion. However, it gives, a, it's a unipolar design, right? One little extension comes off of there, and then it immediately bifurcates. And one branch is a short process that goes, in the dorsal form. Right. And the other process comes from the periphery. It's bringing information. different kinds of um, sensations. It can be somatic or visceral. So let's say, uh, I, I drew blue, let's say blue is for somatic, sensory. SS. What was the other kind? Visceral sensory sensations from your viscera, we call that BS. Try to draw a green guy in there. You know, so what we learn is that the dorsal root is sensory in its function. Okay. The ventral root, number nine, is motor. So you can call it ventral or anterior root. <laughs> Motor. Those uh, cells have the uh, multipolar Structure. And it can be somatic motor or it could be visceral motor. Uh, this orange or red look the similar, but uh, I'll put VS for visceral motor. Now, the multipolar um, motor neurons that are somatic motor, the cell bodies are in the ventral horn. And they extend their axons through the, um, the ventral root. <coughs> uh, 
and the visceral, um, I'm sorry, I put VS, I should have put VM, sorry about that, for visceral motor. The cell bodies of the visceral motor neurons, they're kind of in the lateral horn there. Right? And they'll extend their axons, you know, through the ventral root. Yeah. My colors are getting mixed up. Anyways, those are the four functions that we have here. Somatic motor, visceral motor, and also somatic sensory, visceral sensory. So we, I just got to like nine. Now, when notice how like when they merge together, that's when you call it number ten, spinal nerve. The spinal nerve is it's a mixed nerve because it has motor and sensory function, and it's um, basically the two roots coming together. Nerve. It's got, it's got all four kinds, right? Somatic motor, visceral motor, visceral sensory, somatic sensory, as I drew. So it's a mixed nerve, but it's a very short nerve. It immediately splits into two rami. A ramus in anatomy means arm. So the two arms of the spinal nerve are the dorsal ramus and the ventral ramus. So I guess I call 11 uh, the um, dorsal ramus. also called posterior ramus. It's supposed to be smaller in size. I didn't really draw it that way because I knew I had to draw like these four colors inside of it. But the dorsal ramus is a smaller nerve than the ventral ramus. The ventral rami, those are usually the nerves that will innervate our body parts, like upper limbs and lower limbs. So they're, they're much bigger. ramus or anterior ramus. Ramus is singular. Rami with an I pluralizes it. Can we move on? There's other structures on here actually, but mm, they're for autonomics. I'm not really teaching that yet. These structures there. But I got all the way. Let's kind of use the figure to relate. Here is posterior root, right? What do you call that bulb? Well, that's the spinal ganglion. Sometimes they call it the um, posterior root ganglion. I'll accept either. Okay, what's, what's this one? It's the anterior root. Let me ask you this. Is the anterior root, is it motor or sensory? Motor. It's only motor. Okay, but what about the posterior root? It's only sensory. And then, a very short lid right here, spinal nerve. You see how it immediately divides that little branch there? That little branch there. So look for these things. Okay. First know it, then look for it. If you don't know it, and then just looking for things, um, no, it's harder that way. And so, the gray matter. Um, has these different horns, and well, this basically is what I uh, we attempted to draw, except on the other side, right? And I tried to keep the colors the same. What I drew here, and then this figure there. So let's see if you're with me here. What's SS stand for? Somatic sensory. And do you see where they put the blue on the gray mat? Boom. Somewhere in the dorsal horn. So if that's somatic sensory, what's VS? This or sensory, and you can see how that the nerve fibers, the cell bodies are in the dorsal root ganglion, and they're in the synapse <coughs> somewhere in the gray horn. But in the lateral horn, 
we have VM, visceral motor, and then the ventral horn, we have a somatic motor. Okay, and those multipolar neurons will go out. Okay. So that figure is uh, pretty useful in terms of showing the, the functional neurons inside. So let's talk about the white matter. I, I hadn't mentioned that yet. Okay, the figure is pretty clear. They point to um, a column of white matter. I'm oh, sorry, this is the gray matter role. But notice they have the gray commissure. I don't like where they put the leader line. They're not even pointing to it correctly. That's the publisher's fault, not mine. Um, I do want you to know the commissures. OK, I, I wanted to do the white matter. There it is, sorry. The white matter are, are arranged into columns. They have a funky word called funiculus. And it's one of the few times I'll just say, call it column. Dorsal column, ventral column, lateral column. You can forget about funky funiculus. Okay, <laughs> column is much easier term to deal with. Dorsal, um, ventral, lateral. We'll just go with that. So, how about a like B, C, right? So this is all the white matter arranged in columns. A dorsal column, B ventral column. Lateral column. All right, so the point of learning white matter and gray matter in terms of the anatomy, so you can understand the physiology better, which I'm about to get into. Um, the basic idea um, is. For the gray matter, information goes in and out in, at a particular segment. Okay, let me write that down. For gray matter, particular level, depending on what segment you're on. So also it goes in and out at a segment. Don't forget that period. However, because of the commissures, if it say enters on one side, it can cross over to the other side. So information can go in and out. It can also Decusate, that means cross over to the other side. And so in the gray matter, still under gray matter, info can cross over. So we call that decusate. Go from left to right or from right to left. Okay. Now, information will ascend or descend uh, through the white columns, the A, the B, and the C. White matter. <laughs> Info ascends. Now let's think about this. If it's ascending, it's going up the elevator, I mean, where's the destination if you're going up? The brain. If something's going to reach your awareness, <laughs> so you feel it, is that motor or sensory? It's sensory. So if information ascends, it's sensory. Okay, we'll talk about those pathways. So information ascends or descends. If it's descending, 
it's a motor command coming from the brain and you're going to control some body part. Information that A sends or D sends into columns. So to talk about information ascending or descending, usually how we present it is, okay, you feel something and respond to it. So we first talk about how you feel things, call those the, the sensory pathway receptors. It helps to review the nerve endings we talked about that are in the dermis. Um, yeah. So integument was chapter five. That was the Second test. So some of the sensations in the dermis, this is basically the feeling of touch. But it's more nuanced than that. We have free nerve endings. Um, these are nerve endings that have no encapsulation. It means they're easily triggered to fire. And they, they pick up the sensation of, well, we feel it as pain and temperature. Paper cut, temperature, hot, cold. All right, um, more cold disc, light pressure. So you have, um, they have, they picture a cell and it's stimulating a nerve ending. So there's our nerve ending. So basically that's the um, feeling of light pressure. Hand holding, things like that, light pressure. Um, or discriminative touch. Discriminative touch is you have a corpuscle. So you have the nerve ending, but it has it's lightly encapsulated. So if the nerve ending is not free, but it has an encapsulation the nerve ending inside is a little bit more difficult to stimulate but that will allow you to detect the difference between say rough and smooth okay the texture of something that's discriminative touch if something is um if the nerve ending has many layers around it it's called a lamellated corpuscle um, and it's deeper in the dermis, probably a corpuscle, it's difficult to stimulate that nerve ending. It would only be stimulated with things like deep vibrations. And so that's why um, vibrations or deep pressure are what trigger, trigger those feelings for these nerve endings. Deep pressure or vibrations. And remember, these are all in the dermis. Um, however, you do have sensations in other structures, like muscle and tendons, other sensations. And this is kind of um, the sensation of proprioception, which is different from all the touch senses. Perception, joints and muscles. Info from that. The spindles, 
We didn't talk about them when I talked about muscle tissue. They're microscopic structures between the muscle fibers. I'll talk about them in more detail later. For now, just know that um, it's basically always sending information to your central nervous system about muscle tones. Okay. Like stretch reflexes. A stretch reflex is a good example, like a tendon knee jerk, when the doctor taps your tendon and you kick. Because when the doctor taps the tendon, it's stretching out the muscle. And the muscle reacts by contracting. <laughs> Okay, that's kind of a reflex. Well, anyways, what's doing it? The spindles in there are, are very stretch sensitive. And so um, that's, that's an example of how they're triggered. In the tendons there, what they show is a muscle fiber within the dense regular connective tissue collagen fibers all wound up in there. GTOs, as they're called. Basically, these are sensations. Have you ever, like, you know, woken up and you slept funny and you can't feel your arm? Yeah. Isn't that weird? What is that? You've lost this. Okay. And as you move around, the blood flow is restored and you can feel again. So basically, what I say is joint perception. You, you, you have the sense awareness of your limbs in three-dimensional space. Okay, I close my eyes and I put my arm like this. And I know what my arm is doing. And you're like, well, how can you know? You're not looking at it. That's ridiculous. You know what your body is doing. You have kinesthetic awareness. It's all under the category of proprioception. <coughs> you have the sensation of uh, your body limbs in three-dimensional space. And when you lose those senses, you're very aware of that. You can't take it for granted. In terms of... Um, this topic in terms of um, detecting if there's a problem, there's what's called a dermatome map. Because that's where some of these nerve endings are. So for example, um, you don't have to know this map, but just the idea. If you have numbness on the back of your arm right around here, the physician may say, well, huh, this nerve root, you may have a problem, okay? So is that, if you can't feel something, if it's numb, is that a motor or sensory malfunction? If, you, if it's numb, it's sensory. The question is, is there a motor loss with it? You start testing the muscles in that, in that area. Uh, but, but anyways, the dermatome map is basically uh, mapping out the spinal nerves uh, according to their sensations. And uh, we'll take a break, but what we'll do is when we come back from break, we'll talk about all the neuronal pathways that you send all the way up to the brain. Okay, so come back at about, uh, about 9.20, about 15 minutes.